Today, we're going to travel back in time over 63 million years to meet an ancestor that you and I actually share with every living primate on Earth. And this is an important journey because already in this course, we've looked at how over the past few thousand years, people have answered the question, who are we and where do we come from? So we're going to see what the primate order has to say about that very big question. And while the details, they may be innumerous, but primatologists, they actually have a pretty simple and straightforward answer. Who are we? We're primates. Apes, actually. And where do we come from? Well, we come from a long line, an amazing line of primate ancestors. And it's because we share this primate family tree that it's not surprising that the more that we interact with and study our primate cousins, the more we see the depths of our shared genetic heritage. Now, don't get me wrong. We share much more than our genetics, but today we're going to see how our shared evolutionary heritage with the primates is also evident in the way we think and act. Not all primatologists, not all of them are anthropologists, but anthropologists do rely on the work of primatology to discern what it is that makes us human. So let's start by considering how and why anthropologists integrate primatology into our study of humankind. And then we'll take a closer look at our primate family tree. Imagine the last time you saw a monkey or an ape. Maybe you're at the zoo or maybe watching a movie with some simian co-star, right? Um, one of my childhood favorites was this short-lived series called Lancelot Link, right? Lancelot Link, secret chimp. Um, this cast of chimpanzees, right? They chased each other. They double-crossed each other. They were international spies, right? They wore these human clothes. They skied. They drove flashy sports cars. They even talked, albeit through dubbed voices. But I loved that show. But think about that. Why? What is it that makes apes wearing sunglasses and driving convertibles so funny? Well, from Lancelot Link to that Move It, Move It lemur in the animated film Madagascar, um, we human primates, we, sh we really enjoy seeing our primate cousins doing human things. And it's as if we might be hardwired to enjoy blurring those lines between them and us. Every time we see a chimpanzee wearing a tuxedo or playing a video game, it tickles our funny bone because they're amazingly similar yet entirely different from us. And it's peering into that divide, right, that primatologists test the boundaries of what makes us human. And as we'll see, the deeper we look into the lives of our primate cousins, the more we're going to see ourselves. Take, for example, a remarkable study from the Yerkes National Primate Research Center at Emory University. And I tell you, if this experiment doesn't show you the human-like depths of our primate cousins, uh, nothing will. So briefly, a noted primatologist, Sarah Brosnan and Franz DeWall, they published a 2003 study titled Monkeys Reject Unequal Pay. Now, the researchers, they did a simple game with capuchin monkeys. Two monkeys, side by side, in separate cages, took turns trading marbles for food treats, like cucumbers or grapes. The first monkey has been trained to basically grab a marble and put it in the hand of a research assistant the second that research assistant reaches out. And that's exactly what monkey one does. <whistles> Grabs a marble, puts it in the hand of the research assistant. The research assistant then reaches in and gives that monkey a grape. Brilliant! Monkey number two sees that and is getting ready for his grape. So now we have monkey number two. Monkey two sees that the game is on. He grabs his marble, gives it to the research assistant, and in return, a grape. They're happy. They're eating the grapes together, right? Maybe even smiling back and forth. But we get to round two. Let's go back to monkey number one again. So here's monkey number one. He does the game right. He sees the hand, right? The research assistant's putting that hand out. So he grabs the marble, puts it right in the hand, and again, a grape. Whoosh, eats it. Brilliant. Monkey number two sees that. He's ready for his turn. Let's go over to that one. Monkey number two grabs a grape, or I'm sorry, the marble, and with, you know, some anticipation for this grape, plops it into the research assistant's hand reaches out, and guess what he gets? He gets a cucumber. Now, he's not really too upset, but he eats that cucumber, but you can see he's ruminating, like his eyes, he's like, wait a minute, that guy got a grape over there. What's this cucumber thing? But he's cool, he eats it, you know, things happen. You and me, we do the same thing, we just roll. 
But here it is. We get to number three. Back to monkey. First monkey. Monkey holds out the hand, right? After giving the marble to the research assistant. And this time, it's really even more exciting because from one marble, this, this monkey gets two grapes. So the monkey's psyched, man. One marble, two grapes. He's eating it. He's just strolling. He's doing great. Number two sort of looking over here like, okay, I see what's going on here. I'm going to give my marble. So he gives the marble to the research assistant. And you know what? When he gets his treat, it's another, it's another cucumber. It's not a grape. It's a cucumber. So he gets kind of upset. He starts munching on that thing. But I tell you, he's not happy about it. He's thinking, man, that guy got two grapes. I get one cucumber. What's going on with this place? I don't think I like my job. So it gets worse. And let me tell you, we get to the last round. And bottom line, we go over here to the cucumber guy. Uh, or I'm sorry, we go over here to monkey number one. And monkey number one goes and, you know, puts the marble in the hand of the research assistant. With the hand still out from the monkey, the research assistant puts those two grapes right back into the hand of the primate. Number one, monkey number one. Monkey one eats it just like before and is still just having the best time of his life. Man, this is a great, great day of the game. I'm getting two grapes for one, right? Uh, but monkey number two, he's kind of getting suspicious here. He's over here ready to give that marble, but, you know, you see his eyes. He's just kind of... So he grabs that marble and he puts it in the hand of the research assistant. And, you know, he's ready, but then when he sees that he's going to get just another piece of cucumber, he gets mad. He reaches his hand in, out of that cage, right? He picks up the cucumber. He doesn't even eat it. He actually whips it at the primatologist, right? He's mad. And once that hits the primatologist, he's running around like a little kid just banging his hand against the wall. I mean, you got to feel bad for this little guy. I mean, he thinks like me. He acts like me. He's so human, right? I mean, he gets upset when he's not treated fairly. And you know what? I totally relate. My dear friends, this is exactly why, from our behavioral similarities down to our shared genetic heritage, that non-human primates can teach us so much about being human. And as an anthropologist, I'll tell you, I'm not directly involved in primate research, but I have so much fun with primatology in the classroom because, after all, to understand our humanity is to understand our unique place amongst all the primates. And so, over the years, we've defined ourselves by what separates us from the rest of the primate order. And our shared evolutionary history, while our differences reveal our uniqueness as humans, we walk upright, we use tools, we have language, and we make fire. We're homo sapiens. But one of the reasons it's so fun to teach and keep up with this primate research, right, is that the more and more we probe these differences, they actually begin to disappear. And what's exciting, right, that's just very exciting because we're getting more and more precise about what it means to be human. I mean, think about this. If other apes can learn English, right, if they can learn language, that might not be the distinguishing factor that we presume it to be. Maybe our humanness is somewhere else. It's something else. For example, what about fire and tool use? Fire and tool use, right? That's definitely a human thing. Can other apes, our closest primate relatives, can they learn to make a campfire? Can they roast marshmallows? The answer is going to surprise you. But how do we go about gathering that information? What methods can scientists use to study non-human primates? I mean, besides trading grapes and cucumbers for marbles, I mean, what is it that primatologists do to produce this knowledge? Well, actually, there are a range of methods, from behavioral observations to genetics, biology, and even fossil analysis. And using all of these tools, primatologists collect data, and they test theories to help us understand our humanity, including our primate roots. Now, generally, primatologists, they tend to specialize in one or more areas, from, say, primate genetics and anatomy to cognition, behavior, and even social organization. So to give you a better idea of what primatologists actually think about, let's, let's visit two, two primatology labs, and let's see some primatologists in action. Then we can review the evolutionary timeline of our primate order so we can actually mark the moment that we became human. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at two exceptional primatologists who do cognitive and behavioral research. And we're going to see how some shared genetics are going to yield some really compelling behavioral similarities. First, Susan Savage-Rumbaugh. Now, 
She's an exceptional primatologist doing amazing cognitive and behavioral research. And her star collaborator in this research is a bonobo ape named Kanzi. And as a bonobo, Kanzi shares almost 99% of our genome, right? And together, Susan Savage Rumbaugh and Kanzi, they definitely teach us that our human bonobo differences could be perhaps a lot more cultural than they are biological. Let me explain. Kanzi lives at a primate research center in Iowa, and he's helped us test language as one of the boundaries between humans and the other apes. Susan Savage Rumbaugh and Kanzi, they speak through lexigrams or, or symbols that represent words, uh, but he cleverly understands Su Susan's spoken English as well, right? And I've seen videos of Kanzi and Savage Rumbaugh making a campfire, and Kanzi methodically completes one task at a time, right? And all along, Savage Rumbaugh, she talks to him, not like a child, but with regular language, just like you and me. And she reminds him, hey, Kanzi, there's a lighter in my pocket, after which Kanzi digs in and grabs it. Kanzi not only builds, lights, and tends a true campfire, but get this, he also makes a s'more, right? Toasts a marshmallow, right? And puts the fire out afterwards with a bucket of water. Kanzi not only communicated with Savage Rumbaugh, but he demonstrated a curious ability to remember and manage complex tasks. And an even funnier example of Kanzi's ability to learn, remember, and manage complex tasks well, it comes from an old TV show named Champions of the Wild, right? And it's on that show that Kanzi played the classic video game Pac-Man. Waka, 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 right? Think about that. On the one level, it's fun to see a non-human ape enjoying an arcade game, but there's a lot going on there. Pac-Man. To last more than 10 seconds in this game, a player's gonna have to keep track of a lot of things, right? I mean, you have to move Pac-Man all around this maze and eat these pellets, and that's easy enough, right? But, but wait, you have to avoid those ghosts, right? They move about the maze as well, independently, and, and they're ready to catch you. They're trying to get you. And to add an extra cognitive layer, when you eat one of those four power pellets, right, in all the corners, you can actually reverse the game and you can start to chase and eat the ghosts. But hold on a second here. It's only when the ghosts are blinking, right? Now, this may be simple brain work for a human like you and me, but what about a bonobo? Apparently, it's not at all out of the question. So we'll return to Kanzi and primate language studies in a future lecture. But for now, let's visit our second primatologist, Lori Santos at Yale. Now, Santos, she explores the cognitive dimensions of primate life. And one of her most intriguing research areas, monkeynomics. Uh, and you heard that right, monkeynomics, right? So basically, after the economic collapse of 2008, Santos wondered, hmm, do other primates share our human inclination towards really risky economic behavior? And well, what she found was they do. They do. Santos and her students taught primates how to use money to buy snacks, right? Then in a series of experiments, she tested their financial strategies by setting up a monkey market. So the monkey market, right? First, the researchers taught capuchin monkeys to use money, kind of like the previous experiment we heard about. They gave monkeys a wallet, and instead of marbles, this time they had a dozen aluminum coins. And they used those coins to trade for food. But at the monkey market, the capuchins eventually got to make a choice, right? Between one of two snacks, generally like an apple, maybe a cube of wiggly jello, you know. But right away, the researchers were thrilled. They discovered that the monkeys, when confronted with a choice, well, they stop and really think about it. Just like you and me, they think about, well, which daily special should I order today, right? But wait, that's when Santos kicks it up a notch. See, because then she actually, she plays around with the prices. Prices at the Monkey Mart change, and some choices become cheaper than others. So let's think about that. Are capuchin monkeys bargain hunters like us? Santos and her research, they tell us most definitely yes. When presented with an apple slice that is half the cost of the jello, the monkeys went bananas for that bargain. They wanted more bang for each buck. And what's even more remarkable is that these monkeys also, right, they were like, just like us. When they had money to spend, they spent it. And Santos, she never saw a monkey save coins for the future. They loved shopping and eating, and they seemed, just like us humans, uh, to just blow the budget whenever we get a dime or two, right? Um, 
Santos has done all kinds of monkeynomics research, including a foray into themes like risk aversion and loss prevention, uh, from Lori Santos and her cognitive research to Susan Savage Rumbaugh's work with Kanzi and other bonobos. Primatologists have a unique point of view when it comes to exploring our big anthropological question, who are we? Where do we come from? And at the nexus of biology and culture, it's their research that helps us explore and refine our definition of humanity. When we realize that apes can use English to communicate with us, when we see monkeys exasperated when they expected equal pay, albeit cucumbers and grapes, um, or like St Santos, where we saw monkeys making the risky economic decisions just like the ones that led to the 2008 collapse of Wall Street. When we see primates learn to do things that we consider to be human, our entire idea of being human has to change. So surprisingly, to truly understand what it means to be human actually is going to require some insight and some comparative research with all primates because we define what it means to be human by identifying both how we differ from and what we share with the entire primate order. Okay, now that we've seen primatologists in action, let's get back to the primate family tree through the lens of both genetics and biology. And when we explore our origins, it's genetics that can dramatically change the way we understand our place in the world. I mean, remarkably, we share a surprising number of genes with all living things. I mean, you name it, and we share part of our genome with it. Sounds strange, but daffodils, for example, well over 20%, right? Can you imagine that? Next spring, when you see those daffodils emerge, you remember, from a strictly genetic perspective, that's your cousin. Well, kinda, right? But, but how about this? How much do you think we share with, say, dogs or mice? Which is our closer relative? Dogs, they might be our best friends, but genetically speaking, we're much closer to mice. And that's going to explain why mice play such a significant role in human medical research. But when we move from flowers and mice to strictly the primate family, that's where it's going to get fun. So let's take a tour. Let's see the primate family and understand how we stack up with our remarkable cousins. I mean, in essence, we need to figure out how a common ancestor could eventually evolve into such a wide variety of primates, including us talking apes. So to start, let's put it simple. There's three major types of primates. We've got prosimians, we've got monkeys, and we've got apes. And technically, humans, they fit into the ape category. Now, nonetheless, if you go back far enough, we actually all share a common ancestor. We've all been on the same evolutionary freeway. And the only reason why chimpanzees are different from orangutans and humans is that, well, we each took different exits to continue our evolutionary journey. But one important note, we're not saying that we were once chimpanzees. Let's be clear about this. We share a common relative with modern chimpanzees. And even Darwin, a century and more before, he warned us, and I'm gonna quote him right here. He says, we must not fall into the error of supposing that the early progenitor of the whole simian stock, including man, was identical with, even closely resembled, any existing ape or monkey. So, from lemurs and baboons to bonobos and humans, we are all primates. And if we go back far enough, we're gonna see that we share a common ancestor. So now, let me introduce you. Uh, her name is MRCA, Most Recent Common Ancestor. Now, this MRCA, brace yourself, she kinda looked like a squirrel with like long tail. Um, so travel back with me some 60 plus million years to the world inhabited by our MRCA. Um, there's no humans, there are no baboons, no gorillas, none of the current primates exist yet, right? We had not yet evolved into those forms of primates. Instead, we are all living the arboreal MRCA life. And I tell you, life in the trees was groovy. But wait, suddenly, for one reason or another, some of our fellow proto-primates, well, they exited the freeway. 
they left the rest of us to pursue their own unique evolutionary path. And ultimately, they splintered off to become the prosimian branch of our family tree. Just over 60 million years ago, the first prosimians, lemurs and lorises, they diverged from the rest of us early primates. And then the tarsiers broke off a few million years later. So here we are, lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers, right? They're all prosimians. But the tarsiers, they're closer cousins to us humans because they stayed with us longer on that evolutionary freeway, right? It was a few extra million years. So prosimians, they're, they're small. They're often nocturnal primates with like very large eyes. Some of them uh, are leapers, while others actually are great climbers. Um, and lemurs, like all prosimians, they used to be found all over in many places, but now the only lemur populations are in Madagascar. The smallest lemurs, like the dwarf lemur, it would fit in the palm of your hand. But bigger lemurs, like the Sificas, they can weigh up to like 15 pounds. And, and man, those Sificas are amazing. Uh, with their powerful legs, they can jump over 30 feet into the air as they leap from tree to tree. Outside of Madagascar, the other prosimians, lorises and tarsiers, well, they're found in Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and they too are mainly nocturnal tree dwellers, and they're usually really good climbers or really strong jumpers. Um, and in fact, one of our oldest primate fossil remains that we've discovered, that goes back some 55 million years, just after the prosimians broke off on their own evolutionary path. Remarkably, this fossil gives us a snapshot of the divergence of the tarsier from the rest of the early primates. And I promise it doesn't disappoint. Found by a farmer in the Hubei province in China, this fossil, it's an early primate with hands, feet, small eyes, not the big ones, like monkeys, right? They had small eyes like monkeys, not the big eyes like the, the, the prosimians. But it also has other characteristics more commonly associated with tarsiers. For example, it was super small, only about 25 grams. That's, that's about an ounce, right? And it shared similar skill, skull and limb proportions with tarsiers. Scientists named this creature Archisibus Achilles. Archisibus, well, that's the genus name. That refers to the guy's super long tail, which he used for balance while living high up in the trees. Now, the species name Achilles, that points to its more monkey-like heel. Right? So it's definitely sort of a cross between the two. So as the prosimians continued to evolve on their own, the rest of us, early primates, we carried on down the evolutionary freeway until the next group breaks off on its own. First, the New World monkeys. And they're going to break off some 40 million years ago. Then, the Old World monkeys, they're going to follow suit around 50 million years, 15 million years later. So let's take a look at the platyrrhini often referred to as New World Monkeys, yeah? New World Monkeys. Now, New World Monkeys, they can be found in Central and South America. They're tree dwellers, and they like to eat leaves, fruit, and maybe a few insects here and there. And on the small end of the platyrrhini spectrum, we're going to have, say, the marmoset and tamarins. Now, these guys are remarkable primates. They can't change their facial expressions, they don't have opposable thumbs, uh, and they frequently produce twins, right? Then. Once those twins are born, get this. The males are the ones that tend to carry their infants on the back as long as the children aren't busy being nursed, right? So the other side. Let's look at the other side of these New World monkeys. Um, this is called the Sebidae family. These monkeys are also limited to Central and South America, the New World, uh, but they're much larger than marmosets, like the howler monkey, for example. He can grow to over 20 pounds. Uh, another, another example of the Sebidae family, that's the capuchin monkeys. Remember the grape thrower, the, or I should say the cucumber thrower? Um, that's the other side of this family. So let's move on to the old world monkeys. With the new world monkeys and the prosimians departed, the rest of us early primates, we moved on together, further down the primate evolutionary freeway. And we were becoming more and more human all along the way. So ultimately, another group is going to depart and that's going to be the old world monkeys. We have a lot more in common with old world monkeys than we do with prosimians, and even the new world monkeys, even down to our teeth. Now, take a moment, use your tongue and uh, you know, check out your own dentition. 
you start at the front, you know, one side, and you count back to your molars, you're going to find that, well, most of us have about eight teeth on each side, right? Our old world monkey cousins, they also have eight teeth per side. And that's different from the new world monkeys that got off the freeway earlier. They have nine, right? But it goes deeper than that. If you look closely, you'll see that we have the same types of teeth as the old world monkey. So there's two incisors, then there's that canine, then there's two premolars, and then three you know, full-fledged molars. Now, the new world monkeys, they actually have an extra premolar, a third one, that old world monkeys and humans, we got rid of. So old world monkeys, they can be found in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeastern Asia, the so-called old world. Baboons and macaques, those are two examples of old world monkeys. And driving home the depths of our shared genetic path through evolution, the rhesus macaque, that's most frequently used primate in human medical research. Apes. So here we are, all alone, finally, right? With the prosimians off on their exit, as well as the new and old world monkeys taking off on their own, right? All that's left is us apes. It's us. Right? And I tell you what, things are going to pick up quickly for us early apes. It's around 17 or 18 million years ago that the gibbons took off on their own path. Then the orangutan and the gorilla, they did the same. The final phase of this primate and ape story comes after the gorilla. And that's about 7 million years ago when we humans, when we were the ones that left our common evolutionary path. And that actually left the bonobo and the chimpanzee to go on and split off on their own, which explains why we share like some 99% of our genome with both the bonobo and the chimpanzee. Yet, if we go all the way back to the prosimians, we're only at about 80% or so, right? So humans, chimps, bonobos, we were all together the longest on this primate evolutionary freeway. And my friends, this is the uh, primate family tree, right? From the most recent common ancestor, through prosimians, monkeys, and then the apes, we can trace our early human origins through primatology. In fact, the fossil record and genetics, they both allow us, right, primatologists and others, to pinpoint the very moment in our primate history when we became human, when we diverged from the ancestors of the modern bonobo and chimpanzee. So, to recap, let's remember how primatology fits within anthropology. Essentially, it helps us answer our big question, who are we and where do we come from? First, the primates we see in zoos and in the wild, well, they're as modern as you and I. They're, they're not less evolved humans. Um, second, we, all of us primates, we evolved from a common ancestor some 63 million years ago. And last, we're humans, and therefore primates, one of the apes more specifically, and we're most closely related to the bonobo and the chimpanzee. Anthropology, it's the study of humankind over time and space. And that most certainly includes our primate family and history. Why? Well, as we explore the depths of our similarities, both biological and behavioral, with our primate cousins, our shared evolutionary history is magnificently illuminated. I mean, today, we saw how our primate cousins emerged each in their own way over the past 60 million years, including us upright walking apes. But we've yet to consider what is unique about our human branch of this primate tree. I mean, if we've got nearly identical genetics to a bonobo, what is it? What is it exactly that makes us human? What defines us, not as primates, but as humans? These are the questions that lead us from primatology to paleoanthropology, the study of our earliest human ancestors. And that's the discipline we'll turn to in our next lecture.